Hey, readers and writers, I'm Adrian Buskey, and you're watching Fictitious, a show about the storytelling craft of science fiction and fantasy. In this episode, I'm joined by Evie Green, author of the horror sci-fi novel We Hear Voices. In near future England, the economy is collapsing, humanity makes plans to leave Earth for other worlds, and a deadly pandemic steals the lives of children. But when some kids manage to survive, they return from the brink of death with new imaginary friends in tow. Rachel, a divorced mother struggling against poverty, holds her illness-stricken son as life leaves his body. Yet Billy rallies, shaking off the fatal flu. Rachel rejoices at this miracle and feels grateful for Delphi, the persistent imaginary companion she views as Billy's coping mechanism. As her son's behavior grows stranger and more unsettling, she must face the fact that this healing flight of fancy might be something more sinister. Nina, Rachel's teenage daughter, splits her time between parents, school, her first relationship, and training to be among a generation of space colonists looking for hope on a new Earth. But when she realizes Billy's friend Delphi might be dangerous, she learns that he isn't the only child suffering such a condition, and begins seeking answers for her family and others affected. And deep in an underground medical facility, an aging doctor named Graham cares for some of these children whose minds carry an extra passenger. He'll do anything he can to discover how and why they become afflicted, hostile, style and violent, and anything to avoid his home, which seems to be occupied by the ghost of his dead wife. We Hear Voices is a unique blend of horror and science fiction, available now from Berkeley Books. And Evie, welcome yep. to Fictitious. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me here. It's it's really exciting. One of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you uh, about this book, um, I guess kind of twofold. One is because it's such a, an interesting blend of near future sci-fi and horror in a way that I don't see in the market very often. Um, and, uh, and then also because this is your first book in this genre and you've got a long writing history in thriller and uh, and some other stuff which i think is an interesting transition i'm going to get to that latter part later in the interview um but i really do want to hit uh right off from the beginning like what this book is because i think that the way it's kind of marketed um the cover looks very horror the premise feels very horror uh and and tonally there, there's a lot of horror in here um but there are big sci-fi elements that are very important to the story. It's, it's a weird thing, and this is something that gets talked about on the show sometimes, is that like genre mashup is easy to sell in movie, but kind of hard to market in books, where audiences get really glued to particular genres they're into. So I want to know from you, starting off, like what's your kind of author's elevator pitch? Like How do you explain this novel when you're telling people about it? And then I want to talk about just kind of like who the intended audience is and, like, and, you know, and how this is being marketed. You're completely right. I suppose my my official elevator pitch would be along the lines of what you just said, I suppose, the story of a little boy recovering from a potentially deadly virus with the help of an imaginary friend who goes on to become sinister and it's set against a near future backdrop of climate collapse and space colonisation. So that would be the official elevator pitch, I suppose. But if I'm talking about it, I I say it's it is horror, but it's also a thriller and it's also as you say got a lot of science fiction in it and in some ways it's my last my previous four books have been YA and I think it does have elements of young adult fiction in it as well in that one of the main characters is a teenager so a little bit of that it, it is a mashup of everything I didn't sit down to write a horror novel a science fiction novel I just sat down to write a book and this was what happened when I just <laughs> beached myself <laughs> because I was writing it for my own entertainment just for fun and um, yeah so now I've discovered that if I write a book just for fun it comes out as horror which is is a thing to find out about yourself but yeah <laughs> there we go <laughs> I think it's yeah when I especially when people who write in other genres uh let themselves um you know play essentially more so than you know writing for publication and just kind of figuring out where your brain goes um there it sometimes is that discovery of like oh there's genre waiting you know in the wings for you and when it's horror then all the people in your life can stop and look at you sideways and be like what now what, what are you writing <laughs> 
<laughs> which, you know, is always entertaining when everybody in your life is looking at you like, you write what kind of stuff and about yeah. what and you research what? And yeah, so that, that horror is fun in, in that way. Thematically, this book covers a lot of ground, too. So, I mean, like genre wise, you're touching a lot of stuff. But when you know we're looking at the thematic stuff in here, I mean, you've got themes of, like you said, climate collapse and corporate greed and um, and and parental issues and um, I just so much. And then you know, there's this whole like backdrop of a pandemic, um, which we'll touch on a little bit further in here. So thematically, when you're getting in, you said that you kind of were writing this for yourself to begin with and discovered that your inner horror writer wanted to emerge. Thematically, were there things that you were kind of setting out to play with to begin with, or did you find them over the drafts? There were. The the corporate greed and the um, ecological breakdown were things that were there right from the beginning. And what I wanted to do was I suppose at its heart, it's a family story. And I wanted to set a, a family struggling with poverty, with living in a world with great, um, like huge differential between rich and poor, living in London, which is a city that I lived in for years and years myself. I don't live there anymore. But um, London has a most enormous high housing crisis going on now. So and the way things are going, I feel like all of that is seems to be getting more extreme. So I wanted to to do that. I wanted the absolute core of the story. The thing that I first sat down to write was a story about a little boy with a voice in his head that, no, no spoilers, but isn't really an imaginary friend. It's something a lot more sinister than that. So, and then everything, I thought I'd do it in near future London just to look at the, the climate collapse and all the things that really prey on my mind as a parent and as a human being. Um, and it just all the rest of it just grew from there. There were a lot of things that are in it now that weren't in my initial draft, such as the whole space travel element of it just grew organically, really, from the, the character of Nina, who's the, the very sensible teenager looking for a way out of it all. Every, everything that turned up in my head, I suppose I allowed myself to take it and run with it because I was, wasn't writing it for publication. So it, it did its own thing. <laughs> when you were working with editorial on that, uh, I think a lot of times editors are looking for uh, you know, more fleshed out themes or sometimes looking to kind of narrow focus of things, depending how sprawling and epic of a story is. Uh, in this instance, what were your editors kind of giving you feedback on when they, you were hitting so many different things? There's a lot of disconnected pieces that do come together in a big way as the story goes on. But early on, I could see people reading it and being like, well, how does this go together? And I'd, so I wonder what the, yeah, the editorial feedback feedback was that on that? Yeah, I was really lucky with my editor um, at Berkeley, Jen, because she was very much what she liked about it was that it was mad and out there. And she just encouraged me to go with that to make it more and more and more. So that was really fun. because I've never had an editor who has, has just been like, yeah, do that as long as it made sense in the world <laughs> of the story. Right. She'd be like, yeah, put in loads of spiders, you know, or um, there are there are spiders featuring in the book. Um, just really encouraging me to push it as as far as I wanted to as long as it all made sense within its own world which was great one of my previous books it was a very very short book I was writing and there was one thing where I had an editor pulling me back to make something less extreme it was about postnatal depression and I went with her um, suggestion to dial it right back and that is why one editorial regret I've always had and this book was the opposite of that it was just dialing it up and dialing it up and having fun with it that's probably going to be the most fun uh, like feedback to get which is like now crank it to 11 let's turn it all <laughs> the way up and see what happens I, I think there's if there's an elephant in the room it's that there is at the heart of this story a flu-like pandemic uh, sweeping through the, the world, through the nation, uh, and that people are having to react to it in, in a lot of crazy ways. And it's also surrounded by conspiracy and people who don't believe it's real and that people think it's much worse than being told. And this novel was written before COVID-19 hit, right? So Completely, yeah. Yeah, so that had to feel unnervingly prescient for you uh, after the fact, but it can also be very unnerving for an audience who's reading something that echoes real life in such a big way. So I want to know what it was like um, ex just experiencing that, feeling like you were ahead of the game slightly on it, um, which has got to be in a way kind of terrifying, um, and sort of what you need to do to sort of you know let the audience know that like oh this is a this is a thing that we knew was was 
an issue and uh, um, and we want to let you know that it wasn't influenced by current current events. Like, how did you handle that? Yeah, it, it was it was really unsettling because I had finished the I think I finished the last of the proofreading um, in November a year ago. So COVID-19 wasn't something I think there were just beginning to be a very few reports coming out of China, but it w- it wasn't something on on our horizons at all. It, and I did a lot of research into pandemics. It was, and so many of the things in the book are now real. Like in um, in We Hear Voices, you have to wear a face mask to travel on the London Underground, which I just made that up for the book. And now it's true. It's, um, and I would never have imagined that a year later that right. would actually be be the case. So it is very unsettling. It's um, totally bizarre to see some things are uh, as I extrapolated them to be some things are completely different it's very weird obviously the the least of anybody's worries in a pandemic is is how it's going to affect your book but it has been strange to see it coming true in a way and also I was a little bit worried like who wants to read a pandemic book right now it's something that's all over our news all the time but the pandemic is is really just the beginning of the book and um it's you know it's not fully a pandemic book so it's it has a lot of escapism in it even though it does begin in a pandemic world that's been a lot of talk in book marketing circles and reader circles too is that uh when something like this is happening there is half the audience that runs screaming from anything that feels like real life and there's uh-huh. another another half that dives right into it um a lot of pandemic books like rocketed up the charts, uh, older books where people were suddenly reading these stories. I feel like Chuck Wendig's The Wanderers it seems to be prescient about certain things that happened recently. Uh, the Book of M by Pung Shepard um, also kind of hits these things in a little way, in a spec fic way. I think that science fiction and horror to a degree have always been good about using speculative fiction as almost a guidebook for like what can happen, where do we go, where are the warning signs. Because uh, if yeah. nothing else, I mean, we live in a present age where like cyberpunk warned us about so much of the, you know, our present foibles um, in society. Uh-huh. It didn't necessarily yeah. know what social media was going to be, but it figured out that technology would mess us up in a lot of ways. And, you know, science fiction has always been so prescient about stuff. And so I think looking at the pandemic things, when you read those stories, it gives us a roadmap for just how wrong some things could go. But hopefully some yeah. hope at the end of it as well. Uh, and also hope in these situations that we are you know, not going to deal with weird imaginary friends. Although I will throw in there that I saw a tweet just this morning from author Alex E. Harrow, who's been on the show a couple of times talking uh-huh. about how her two-year-old now has an imaginary friend named pinky and no. had so, yeah and this morning was having some really weird interactions with pinky which were slightly unnerving for alex and i couldn't <laughs> help but read that tweet after reading this novel and being like oh no oh no <laughs> No, so, we'll, no. so we'll be checking in on the tweets to make sure Alex is OK uh, after this <laughs> is over. But uh, but it certainly there was a certain, I don't know, kismet that seemed to go along with reading that. Uh, wow. But yeah. <laughs> and we touched on this just briefly ago. But like um, in the way this book is marketed and the way that it's being introduced to audiences um, and the book is, has just hit stores as we're we're talking is this being pushed towards horror? Is it being pushed towards sci-fi? Like, how is it being act- actually marketed out there? And I think, especially for you as a debut author in this genre, like, what does that look like for you? And what are those conversations like um, internally about where they're approaching audiences to kind of get this in people's hands? Yes, I think it's being marketed as horror. I was I was writing it quite late on in the in the writing process. I was thinking it was sci-fi. It was speculative. I didn't ever think of it as being horror until my editor called up and and said I think this is this is actually horror and and that's how we're going to sell it and then I did a few more edits with with horror in mind because that hadn't been at all what again I was I was writing the book and not thinking about genre at all so that took me by surprise a little bit it's a genre that I've read but I would never have been brave enough to sit down to say, right, I'm going to write a new novel and it's going to be horror, something I've never written before. I, I wouldn't have set out to do it, but it, it the book just took itself over there. So now I'm really enjoying going with it. Yeah, it's out there being sold as horror, which is really cool. I, I love the cover and I, I love thinking that this is my horror book. Wow, I never yeah. thought I would do that. 
<laughs> well, it's going to be fun to get your to get your stuff in a new you know category, a new place on the shelves too. You know, we've yeah. talked about the fact that there are like there are several kind of what start off feeling a little disconnected um, pieces and how they join together, both with a couple of different narratives in the story, but also these different fundamental pieces. How do you balance all of that? How do you approach saying, okay, I mean, obviously having different POVs is is normal for a novel, uh, but also having these things where like, you know, you do have sort of this sort of uh, psychological medical drama kind of happening on top of this pandemic and there's spacefaring, but there's, there's also this home horror. Keeping that both in pacing as you're developing out exposition, uh, like, and also just kind of filling out that world because because you know you do have economic collapse and you do have you know, corporate greed and and there's sort of a reoccurring background not exactly a character but a a guy that's this not guy named Guy Clement who um you know is is this sort of astronaut turned advertising shill that kind of gets mentioned in the background and is sort of used as a way of exploring the way the materialism and, and greed has hit the society. Uh, there's a, there's a lot of pieces going on there. So as you were writing it, how did you figure out like how much time to spend on each one of these things, when to switch back and forth, how to make sure that the, the audience is, is not getting bogged down in any one piece as you make the switch between them? How, like, how did you manage that? I did it by editing so, so, so many times. I've never been back over and edited a book so much as this one because it, it is normally I'd have one or maybe two protagonists and jump between between them but this there was so much going on I would I had a lot of notes I would refer to all the time kind of uh, world building stuff and for how much time to spend on each I would just write it as I felt I would like to read it and then go back and and work it out and then once I was working with Jen my editor she would say when she thought we needed to if she thought we needed to cut somebody else's story at a particular point I'd rework it a little bit but so much of it I think I go with my instinct I I when I I feel if I'm getting a bit bogged down in a storyline then obviously nobody's going to want to read that because they're going to feel the same so I will try and try and work it out but mainly I think I do a lot of work with um, teaching writing and I think people very often think you know, you sit down, you write your novel, that's basically done. But this had so much editing, so, so, so much going back and cutting it out. It did have a few more um, strands at one point, other characters. And then I, you know how ruthless you can be. I was going through it, just finding these characters. There was, there was a character who was Rachel's sister and just like find her name through the document, delete her from it. Just absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> no, sorry. You would never Savage. Thought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, a lot of people probably don't realize how much uh, books can be like a film where like you're literally leaving things on the cutting room floor and sometimes there isn't mm -hmm. room for people. Um, I think that actually gives kind of a good segue to talk about characters here, which um, there's kind of three core POV characters to talk about. And then, of course, Billy, who's very, very important to all this as well. And one thing I want to hit before we dig in each, each one of them, I want to note that like Rachel is a, a middle aged mother. Uh, her mm -hmm. daughter Nina is a teenager who's still in high school. This other, this doctor whose name is Graham is in his seventies. So we get a pretty wide swath, uh, like demographically, age-wise, for each one of these characters and very different places in their life in the story. Um, Rachel is a mother. She's a divorcee, um, living with a really great, uh, like new live-in boyfriend. They have another child together. She has a, sort of a, a early forties uh, child, and they have two other kids from her previous marriage. And they're just barely holding it together. You know, they're just on the edge of poverty. Parts of this resonate with me because as a kid, I grew up in a, in a household that was like, you know, living paycheck to paycheck. And so uh, I totally understood that desperately trying to figure out how to keep the, you know, the, the dollars and cents together so that your family doesn't collapse. Um, but on top of that, she has to deal with a child who gets this pandemic flu. Uh, and it's not actually a flu, but that's how people describe it. And then, you know, she has the joy of having Billy, you know, rally and come back from it, but come back with this, this friend you know basically how do you describe Rachel as a character or what kind of motivates her um, and then I really want to explore like thematically what you're exploring with her because obviously motherhood parenting um, and you know how far you would go to help your child are kind of all in the mix of this which sometimes are familiar themes in horror they seem mundane but they really do find their way into horror a lot so um, what can you tell us about Rachel and what drives her um, yeah Rachel's a uh woman in her 40s with three children. I am also a woman in my 40s with three children. So I suppose I had, I was 
starting from a point of writing about the things I knew with her, but it, it, it changed. I've been through times of struggling to hold it together financially and having that like, what are we going to eat for dinner moment. She's the person trying to make things right for everybody, for her baby, her six-year-old, her teenager, and her mother who lives across London at the top, in her apartment at the top of the tower block. So she's also responsible for her mother. And she has a, a fairly difficult relationship with her ex-husband who she has to see because she's got the two children with him. So she, Rachel is, I think, constantly trying to make sure everything's all right for everybody as best she can. And the only person she's not looking after is Al, her partner, who is really great. And their relationship is the only thing that is actually easy for most of the book because um, she's always just dashing around trying to trying to make sure everything's all right. So she's always worried. She's always stressed. She's she's reacting to the world around her and the many, many challenges it throws at her. And I do I do re- uh, relate to quite a lot of what she goes through there. It's a lot to juggle. And uh, and I think that what we see here with Rachel is a lot of the stuff that parents juggle every day, which is, you know, whether it's financial challenges, uh, dealing with the, the difficulties that arise in parenthood and with children, also in, in dealing with school systems. And especially now when sometimes they're in school and sometimes they're distant or whatever, like, you know, the, all those things make a lot of sense. But you're also dealing with the expectations of other parents and your social mm-hmm. group. And like what, you know, your community expects of you and how much they go out of their way to help or hinder your own ability to be safe, which we see lots and lots of right now uh, in this age, especially over here in America, where half the time we can't depend on our fellow Americans to actually make the, the absolute smallest amount of effort to keep other people safe. But there's there's something here that, that really that, yeah that really struck me was uh, and I, I'm going to be delicate in how I handle this. But um, when Billy emerges with this new imaginary friend that's almost a secondary personality that he's talking to all the time with Delphi. Rachel is initially very supportive of it because she looks at the kid just came back from the brink of death. It's you're going to be a little different. You're going to be a little changed and developing a coping mechanism to work with that seems natural and, and healthy. And Billy bounces back fast and using it. But Rachel excuses this behavior for a long time and Mm. in her own POV is kind of constantly sort of making excuses for why Delphi is okay. And I am not a parent. So, um, so I'm only an an observer of the parents that are in my life, you know, um, and the things that they go through. But I have noticed at times with all the, the, the mounting pressure and all the things that you have to do that there are occasionally points where children are dealing with things that are very obviously problems that outsiders can see, but it takes much longer for the parent themselves to actually recognize this as an issue. So looking at that, like as a parent, as a writer, as a person examining this story, you know, what are you looking at there when you see, you know, Rachel is kind of ignoring something that's clearly a problem while her daughter Nina is poking at it going, maybe this is really an issue, you know, that he has this sudden almost like secondary personality that seems to be dominating his life. Um, You know, what were you looking at there? as far as, uh, you know, a role of a parent and their experience. Yeah, it, you're completely right. It is it's something that I think every parent does to a greater or lesser extent. You want, you so much want there not to be a problem with your child that there's a, a very fine line between being optimistic and willfully not seeing things because it would be so, so, so much easier if those things weren't there. And I think, I, I'm sure I've done it myself. My daughter is very dyslexic and I think that other people probably picked up on that before I did because I wanted her to be all right although I picked up on it before her school did and then had like the most enormous battle with them to um, oh. to accept it and I've seen I've seen it in other children with um, with autism and things like that the parents just so much don't want it to be a problem because it's going to be difficult not just for them not just the selfish thing but it's going to be so difficult for the child that you really 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 want them not to have a problem so I think that Rachel has got so much going on in her life and she they've just come through this awful awful experience and Billy's got better she spends a really long time sticking absolutely sticking to her point that Delphi appeared just at the moment she thought he was going to die and and in her view pulled him back to life and then he spends in his initial um recuperation he spends a lot of time just showing things to Delphi and explaining things and suddenly he wants to read books and suddenly 
he's doing so well at school because he's showing it all to Delphi and then Delphi somehow there's a, a, a kind of moment where a, a line is crossed and Delphi's telling him things rather than him telling them to Delphi but it gets a long way past that line before Rachel has to admit it to herself and when she does admit it and she she goes to the doctor and then she has to go to her ex to get him to pay to see a specialist doctor then everything starts unraveling very very quickly after that point and I think she was just trying to hold back from from that point for as long as she can and I suppose looking at it in the sense of the structure of the book the longer she holds back when other people are saying there's a problem the the more I hope the reader is is kind of going do something about it do something about it so it also plays its purpose in in the um the structure of the book too it definitely introduces a level of tension um, because I, and, and like in horror movies, you know, we're used to the audience almost screaming at the screen and being like, do the thing. Don't hide there. Oh, my God. Don't hide behind the chainsaws. What's wrong with you? In this instance, it's the like the like lady wake up and, and, and have your kid diagnosed. There's something wrong here. But I also like, in, you know, in real life, we get scared of labels. We get scared of, of putting mm-hmm. a name to something because once once it's named, once it's diagnosed, then it's a thing. You know, yeah. capital letters, a thing that we have to deal with. And uh, and when you already have too much to deal with, um, you're going to do everything in your power to not introduce a new problem if you perceive it not to be there. So I get that a lot. With Billy, it's like if you go out and read like the Goodreads reviews, especially like the advanced readers that were learning about this thing, the very first thing so many of them say is, ooh, creepy kids, I'm in. Right. Like that's that's a trope <laughs> that uh, that horror fans gravitate towards in a big way. Writing this, is that something that you were consciously aware of that you're like, oh, I'm writing creepy kids. And that is that something that really punches people's buttons. Yeah, they, I, I love a, a creepy kid book. And in fact, probably the very first um, inspiration for this book was uh, Chocky by John Wyndham. So it's a British sci-fi book from the 1960s about a kid with a voice in his head. Nothing else about it is the same, but I'd found that book in a a charity bookstore here and bought it and read it again. And I remembered reading it when I was inappropriately young to read it when I was about 10. (laughs) And it just, it really set off that like, oh, creepy kids, like ding, 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 story, story collection in my head. Um, And I think if you have a baby, sometimes babies will just stare at something that isn't there for ages and with really expressive faces. They'll just like stare at absolutely nothing. And I remember when my kids were babies just being like, what are you actually looking at? And why are you making faces at it? There's not li- like literally nothing there. Is it what are you actually <laughs> seeing? You do get strange, not sinister, but inexplicable moments with kids in real life or they'll come and tell you some really weird dream they had or they when they go a little bit unknowable it's really creepy and strange and I think that's that's something I was really interested in pulling out because I do uh, yeah I do I love a a creepy kid story as well I think um, there's just something about it because kids are supposed to be just you know small people who will grow up into adults and if you do all the right things they eat right they don't have too much screen time everything is going to be fine and sometimes it isn't and that's one of the great horrors if something goes wrong with your child suddenly you can lose control over everything and that's something that I was really interested in exploring I think uh what's fun with kid stories too is that they don't quite live in our reality they're little humans but their brains process things different um their context is more limited but also wide open um because their imaginations are still at play in such a big way so yeah you do get strange moments with kids where they walk up and just say anything to you apropos of nothing and trying to contextualize that as an adult living mostly grounded in the real world can be pretty jarring at moments. So, uh, so yeah, that makes perfect sense. You mentioned earlier with the character Nina. So you have a teenage character in here. It's the daughter, the teenage 17 year old daughter of, of, of Rachel. And, uh, and so you felt almost like you were kind of almost having like a partially a, a YA narrative in this, because you do have a young person who is going through her first relationship, who is navigating school and has all this other weight on her. First off, I want to say about Nina is that she's kind of refreshing and not like that. She is by her nature, a very responsible, and helpful kid and that's yeah. kind of refreshing to read from the standpoint of not having an angry rebellious rebellious teenager um but I, what i also liked about the character is that sometimes uh, not a what you would call like a you know the right like reader for ya novels is like a 43 year old dude you know um but um but i do read a lot of them for the show and i like a lot of them but i struggle sometimes with 
that some writers write a teenager like they're in an, like a full on complete moron um, and have no idea what's happening. Or they write them like they are 45 years old and know everything about the world and they're the best there is like at what they do and yet still act like a hormonal 16 year old on top of it. And it's very weird and very jarring. To me, Nina feels like a smart and competent but still 16 year old kid who's learning the world and that felt like like i said very refreshing to me from a perspective so um what can you kind of tell me about nina's role in the story how you were constructing her and how the just the various pursuits that she has um line up with everything that's happening in the plot she has the kind of clarity of vision i think that that the adult characters don't necessarily have i think partly because she's not worrying about how to pay the rent about how to buy the food because she is still living at home she goes between her parents houses but she's she doesn't have the day-to-day worries in the same way that Rachel does so she has a a different sort of horizon to her world and she knows that there's this space colonization going on and her big thing is she doesn't want the same people you know the people with all the money the people in control to be the ones to go to the new planet and set up the whole new society up there and then for it to be because if they do it it'll be just the same as here she wants to do it she wants to be one of the first people she wants to go and play her role in setting up something completely completely new and she's carried away by that totally totally wants to do it and works hard at school has got herself onto this program for space training she's she's just very very focused on wanting to do that wanting to to go into space but she also has a clear view of the problems going on with billy because she doesn't have quite the same emotional investment as rachel does in it and doesn't i suppose doesn't have the same responsibility for it she can look at him and go this is not right this imaginary friend thing is not right why can't mum see it my eldest child is um 19 now and he's there's quite a lot of him in Nina in that he's always been very responsible, very much thinking to the future. He he works hard at school. He he does all the things he needs to do when he needs to do them. My other children, not quite so much. But <laughs> I, I just felt like there are those teenagers around. And you, as you say, you don't really see them in fiction very much. So I just I think the younger generation, the generation who are now teens, they can be absolutely amazing. And I just wanted to to put that into the book and also to say if these people like Nina are in charge of the future then maybe they'll do it a little bit better than we have I think there's a fun element in this too is that like um part of what Nina does in this story is one kind of figure out that the Delphi imaginary friend issue is a problem but also (laughs) she's the one that kind of stumbles on the fact that this is not uh something that is that is unique to their situation that other people have done this and part of how that happens is that she has just a schoolwork assignment where she basically more or less has to set up a wordpress site um and uh and i appreciate that because i'm a wordpress developer you know like a front-end site designer so uh so for me i was reading that and i was like ah she's updating her plug and setting up the security she's doing a wordpress site uh <laughs> but um uh but you know she basically has to do this this for a computer science uh class and in the process she basically starts blogging and starts talking about what's happening under a pseudonym and that is a thing that allows her to connect with other people and um and i think that that resonates a lot with just uh, the nature of the world in a lot of ways right now where you have the sort of like sub niches of people who nobody is listening to and they find each other online um and start to share stories and start to have movements happen and sometimes that turns into crazy conspiracy theories and sometimes that turns into social movements that are necessary and discerning the difference between the two can be challenging sometimes uh, for a lot of people but um but yeah so it makes sense within this story and one of the things that nina kind of eventually kind of discovers um we have this this doctor i mentioned him early this like this this doctor named graham in his 70s he doesn't appear in the book until i'd say uh like 10 or 12 percent into like i was reading this uh you know on kindle so like uh, probably about 12 percent away into the book where he first kind of shows up and he seems like he's got a fairly normal job until he hops into sort of a hidden elevator and goes seven floors below ground and meets up with a group of uh semi creepy kids who all are carrying this extra voice in their head who have all recovered from this and he also has a secret of his own which is a little bit of a left turn in here but figures into the story as well so what can you tell me about graham about what he's doing at this facility and uh, maybe speak a little bit just about the situation with his wife yeah um he's graham um is the first person really professionally to draw the connection between the children who've recovered from the flu with an imaginary friend. Um, I think 
until he started pulling it all together professionally, um, it was just each family would think their child had an imaginary friend and then would, would deal with the consequences of it. And he's seeing children um, in his professional practice who are going through this to such an extent that he realises that it is actually something that's happening, not necessarily something that anybody official would like to be known about the flu virus. So he does have for for multiple reasons he has this group of children a long way below ground and that's another of the mad things about london is that there are i don't think they're allowed to do it anymore but there are a lot of these so-called iceberg houses where they've dug out huge basements underground like 15 20 floors around yeah it's really mad and then things were starting to fall into them i don't think that they can still they're still allowed to do them but there are houses like like a pretty normal townhouse and then underneath there'll be like a, a car park of, full of Ferraris and a cinema and a swimming pool. It's so all of that really does exist. The iceberg houses, they're completely that is mad. So crazy. I'm going to fall down such a rabbit hole looking at that yeah. after oh, the do, fact. Do, wow. Do. Yeah. Yeah. Look up iceberg houses. It's, it is mad. So his hospital in central London or his, where his office is underneath that, there is a, a secret hospital and he has one floor of it where he has these children, the children who have become so disturbed that their families have, have sent them away secretly to be cured by by Graham Watson. So he is very, very invested in this. And when he sees Billy, he is the first person who knows kind of exactly what he's dealing with and what the trajectory of that is likely to be, which is not that he will gradually get better and everything will go back to normal, as Rachel would have hoped it to be. It was something that he was already invested in from even before the pandemic, but I won't say any more about that. As he makes his first appearance in the book, he is at a point where he just can't go home. He's got a lovely flat in London where he lived with his wife for many, many, many years. But she dies before the beginning of the book. She's died from the flu. And he suddenly had this huge wave of guilt and grief because he knows he was not a nice husband to her in that he was always so busy and so busy being important and professional and she would try and do lovely things and he would say no I'm too busy I can't meet you in the park I can't let's not go away to Venice for a weekend because I've just got too much work to do and he's suffering from this huge amount of regret and that's for him is manifesting itself as seeing her ghost in their flat all the time and he really really believes that it's her ghost and maybe it is so he's stopped going home because he can't deal with it she he falls apart completely when when he walks through the door and just sees her doing what she would normally have been doing in their apartment um so he's basically living sleeping under his desk thinking that it's like it's like um the people who are going to travel to colonize space he's sleeping in a tiny space tiny little space of his own and then he'll he'll have a shower in his little shower in his office go out to breakfast come back and make sure he arrives after his his PA gets there so that she thinks that he's arriving for the day but he's he's kind of trembling under his desk all night long because he doesn't dare go home so he's got very much got his own demons I think there's a really interesting parallel um, going between Graham and Rachel in this story because Rachel is the person who is absolutely devoted to her children beyond anything else in her life. Um, she's taken time off from work, but work is just a job. She's left like a job as a lawyer to work at as a, as a receptionist, basically because it was less demanding and, and easier on her psychologically. And Graham is the opposite. He's completely career driven. He's basically ignored his children. Um, he's aware that his adult children basically don't care about him and that when, with their mother gone, they're basically completely disconnected from him. And so I thought there that was an interesting way of kind of, of paralleling two very different type of parents styles and seeing the way that it affects their lives, you know, long term and and uh, and their decision making and stuff. So um, so I, th I thought that was kind of a, a fascinating way. I don't know if that was super intentional when you were putting it together that way or if it just kind of happened. It just happened. Yeah, it wasn't at all intentional. In fact, I hadn't really thought of it like that until you just said it. But yes, yeah. um, Graham's <laughs> just left all of that stuff to his wife. And then without her, like you say, his I think one of his daughters in law rings him from time to time to see if he's all right. But he's basically yeah he's he's reaping what he sowed with his parenting and that he didn't take really any part in his children's upbringing and as a result they wish it was him rather than their mother who had died and he knows that so yeah, well, going forward you can you can tell everybody that it was absolutely intentional and that was thematically mm. something you were exploring with it because that's the beauty <laughs> of writing stuff is that afterwards when people tell you what's there you can go yeah i absolutely meant for that to happen for sure yeah <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I want to know what your writing process is, uh, because like we've said, there's a lot of different narratives here. There are several POVs. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on in the background. Um, so I want to know, especially, and you said it was a big editorial uh, process for this book. So uh, methodically, like, what did you use to manage all that stuff? Uh, like, how did you track your changes and go through? Like, so from the technical end, what were you writing in? And, and yeah, what was that process like? Yeah, I was writing in pages on a MacBook and that's where everything was. I also have a lot of notes and comments throughout anything I'm writing. So I'll kind of put a note on something to come back and, and change it or or with an idea of something that I might do. But basically, I was just writing it straight on to into pages on my MacBook. And my actual process is that I'll just get up really early in the morning and I find that really helps because there's no point getting up at 5.30 or 6 in the morning to write and then just not writing, just finding other things to do. There's no distractions at that time of day, especially not now my children are all teenagers. So there's I know I'm not going to see anyone until they have to get up for school. <laughs> so I'll be up early in the morning with coffee and I just work main whether I'm writing or editing, I'll just work on absolute targets. Like I cannot get up until I've written 2000 words or or edited up to page 33 or, or whatever. So I'll just go through it, do what has to be done. Going back through and editing, I get really annoyed and frustrated with my past self, who has normally left <laughs> notes on there saying things like, make this bit good. Like, yeah, thanks. I'll, I'll just make that good, shall I? Yeah, or like like this, but better. Um, okay. So yeah, I'll have, I'll have um, little fights with my past self, but um, just just blast through it until it's done, really. Are you a, a pantser slash discovery writer or an outliner? Like, what's your process look like? And do you use any kind of plotting system? Anything that um, you know helps you along through it? I'm sort of like halfway between being pantser and a plotter. I, I'll know where it's going. Like, I knew the ending of We Hear Voices right from the beginning, and that last chapter was probably the, the part of it that I edited the least over the whole process of it. But how to get there just went through so 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 many different things so I'd try something and it wouldn't work or it would nearly work and then I'd go back and try it again and it does involve deleting tens of thousands of words and um, writing a lot more than you actually end up with in the book but sometimes I feel like I can only really get it to where it needs to be by actually writing it because the characters don't always do what you might plan for them to do so mm. probably not a very efficient way of doing it time wise but it, it works for me <laughs> At, 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 at the end of the day, it's uh, what works is all that matters. This is uh, so Evie Green is a pseudonym. Um, you've been writing for a long time under a different name. You've written a lot of thrillers. You've been a journalist. You've um, you've used extensive travel to inform your stories uh, in in those other genres. How different did it feel? going from like thriller and YA into horror did you f did did you feel under a new name like you were a new person writing this or did the process feel very similar to how you normally do it like what was that experience like it did a bit and the more I use the name Evie Green for things the more I feel like that is actually a different version of me and I get to um I don't know I I, I feel a little bit more interesting when I'm being Evie Green um <laughs> The actual writing process, from the whole time I was writing the first couple of drafts of it, I was still didn't know if it would ever see publication. So I was just writing it for fun. And I really, really enjoyed it because I was just like, yeah, I'll put this in. I'll do that. It doesn't matter. Then it did have a much longer editorial process than any of the thrillers or, or YA that I've written. So I suppose it it did feel different. It It was the the most protagonists I've ever had, the most, I had to do the most research I've ever had to do into just to kind of make sure that although I took it all to, to um, very fictional places, like the absolute basics of space travel. And I was starting from a place where it was, was kind of plausible. So I had to do a lot more research and then I had to make sure that that was all fed in to the book. Um, and I did, I suppose I spent a lot more time as well thinking about what might happen in the in the near future so Nina's boyfriend is very from a, a very very rich family and I really enjoyed it when she went to his house and I could make up things like the fridge speaking to him about his blood sugar levels because they've got all the AI and the wearable technology the things that that the the super rich can have in contrast to 
what Rachel's got where she's trying to make a bag of lentils last for a whole week to just keep them fed. So I had, I suppose I had to do a lot more kind of sitting, thinking, writing things down frantically with my terrible handwriting in my notebook just to, to try and world build as I went along and the story changed I would be kind of changing the world building of it as well which was a whole a whole new thing for me but really fun uh, one I think having the pen name you know is definitely like a freeing thing to allow you to explore a different side of yourself definitely when it's the horror side of yourself uh, also lets you you know on the shelf set the difference where the the fans of your existing work who may not jump over to this because you know they might be like I read thrillers and YA and oh no like now there's creepy children and stuff um, so it does kind of let you play in a different sandbox um, in a really kind of experimental way which is very very cool uh, before we wrap up where should people follow you I don't know if you want to you know give the big reveal of who you are otherwise in here but i suppose that's kind of necessary since the most of your branding otherwise is under your real name but yeah where should people follow your work online so they know more about what you're coming up with next and maybe they can dive into your back catalog with some of the other stuff absolutely great um my my website is emilybar.com b-a-r-r which is my real name emily bar i'm on twitter as emily underscore bar and but evie green does have her own instagram as of quite recently so there is a an Instagram of which is I think at Evie Hears Voices. So that's the one place that that you get um, undiluted Evie Green, and the rest of it is is kind of all of me. Well, very cool. Well, I'll link all that stuff into the show notes below so people can go and check that stuff out. Like I said at the top, We Hear Voices uh, is available now from Berkeley Books, so it's out there. If you're finding it in a physical store, which I is not a thing I have done in 38 weeks, but, um, <laughs> you know, so finding online is easy. If you're finding it in the store, it might be in horror, might be in spec fic, might be in literature. I mean, I'm not sure where it's being shelved offhand. Somebody, you'll be able to find it. Um, but again, I'll have links to all that stuff uh, in there below. And uh, Evie, thank you so much for joining me on Fictitious. Oh, thanks so much for having me. I've really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you.